All right. Well, it's about time, so we'll go ahead and get started. So um, good evening and welcome. My name is Bob Ellis, and I'm the program director here at the Natural History Institute. And we're delighted to bring this event to you today from the Natural History Institute stage. The Natural History Institute is a small not-for-profit based in Prescott, Arizona, and it's in the heart of the wonder-filled Mugion Highlands. And as I said that we're a mission-driven organization, and that mission is to provide leadership and resources for a revitalized practice of natural history that integrates art, science, and humanities to, to promote the health and well being of humans and the rest of the natural world. In short, we believe the practice of natural history is a prominent solution in solving many of the problems that we face today. So, if you want to learn more about the Natural History Institute, I encourage you to go over to our website, naturalhistoryinstitute.org. And there you're going to find a whole bunch of resources and hopefully some things that you'll be interested in. One of which is our YouTube channel, where we are currently live streaming this broadcast. And um, we will post a video there in about 24 hours. You can also find um, a donate button. So if you like what we're doing, you like what you see, we are not for profit and we're always looking for that public support. <clears throat> so before I introduce our guest, let me tell you how this event will proceed. In just a few minutes after I introduce John, I will turn off the chat function. However, I'm going to leave the question and answer function live so you can ask questions that might come up during John's presentation. And after his presentation, there's gonna be time for discussion. And so it'll be at that time where I introduce your questions. You can also upvote questions. There's a little icon there that can send a question to the top of the queue. If it's a question that you're interested in having to certain questions. And on a final note, John and I are both vaccinated, and so we're going to proceed without masks. So now it is with great pleasure that I introduce tonight's guest. And one of the big reasons that we wanted to host this event is because of John's unusual background. John brings a very unique on the ground perspective on some of the big conservation issues facing the Western United States, if not the world. And so, um, well, let me give you a little bit of his background and that way you can understand the perspective that he brings. John holds an undergraduate degree in political science and a master's degree in conservation biology. Now get this, he has served in the US military, in the US Air Force rather as a survival instructor and intelligence analyst. He's also worked as a gray wolf biologist, conservation biologist, and is a currently the assistant chief of fire and rescue in Red Lodge, Montana, where he's a paramedic, a wildland fire incident commander, and fire behavior analyst. So welcome, John. Thanks. I'm so glad you were able to make it. Yeah, thank you, Bob. It's great. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure. So, um, yeah, I guess I'll just um, I'll roll into the presentation, and um, there's a little bit about myself, and then we'll 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 get going there. All right, I'm, I'm going to share my screen here. So, let's do that. All right. Turn that part off. <clears throat> All right, we tried to, Bob said that a lot of the, uh, the members that watch uh, the, this um, format like pictures. And so I tried to put in quite a few pictures into the presentation. This is a, this lead 
uh, picture is of a fire in Wyoming. Uh, and that's a, one of our, our engines from Red Lodge Fire Rescue and one of our fire crews that are working there in the, in the picture. So I'll uh, roll from there today. Tonight, I'm gonna talk about wolves, wildfire and climate change, kind of an interesting uh, mix, but um, I start to see some interesting relationships and I'll share some of those with everyone. Let's see here. There we go. <clears throat> so as Bob mentioned, my uh, background from uh, being in the Air Force and an uh, intelligence analyst, um, flying in F-15s, F-16s, I really uh, enjoyed that. But I often found myself looking down towards the ground and, uh, and enjoyed being on the ground and observing what was happening there closer. So when I left the Air Force, went back and um, went to school for my master's degree in conservation biology. From there, I worked on the Mexican gray wolf recovery program in Alpine, Arizona, and working with uh, and studying wolves and releasing wolves into the wild in uh, Arizona, New Mexico. Uh, from there, that took me into Idaho, working for the Nez Perce tribe on wolf management in the state of Idaho. Um, and the, the jobs kind of fed onto each other. From there, I was hired by the US Fish and Wildlife Service in Wyoming. And the US Fish and Wildlife Service, as many of you probably know, is the agency that um, administers the Endangered Species Act um, and the species that are listed under there. So, um, so as you know, the wolves were listed under the Endangered Species Act. So in Wyoming, I I worked with wolves and a lot of that um, job in, uh, was made up of monitoring the wolf population. So as an endangered species, we had to make sure that uh, the population was doing okay and meeting recovery goals. That involved uh, trapping and radio collaring. So the picture in the, there where I'm wearing the yellow shirt, um, you can see um, that, was early on we were taking COVID precautions because you can see the wolf has the mask <laughs> on. Uh, no, it wasn't that. That was that was a way that helped uh, help a sedated wolf continue to relax. And so that wolf there is sedated. And um, after that photo, I put on a radio collar and released that wolf. I was in Grand Teton National Park. Uh, moving to the right there, uh, where I'm wearing the gray shirt. That's in Montana, which was my next uh, position in the wolf in the wolf field and um, trapping and radio collaring as well. So that wolf there is a 110 pound male that I trapped and, and radio collared and released back into the wild. And there's usually lots of questions about how we do that. So if you have any questions, you can let me know. Um, and from there, I was living in Red Lodge, Montana and I was working with search and rescue and I, uh, transitioned into becoming a firefighter and a paramedic. And, um, and a lot of that was driven by family choices. So I could be uh, around my family more as a father. So, uh, but I continued to work with wolves and I taught at the Yellowstone Institute for 15 years uh, about wolf ecology and management. Um, as part of my master's program, Bob and I actually taught a wolf, a wolf course, a wolf ecology and management course, two courses through Prescott College. Uh, and that was always a lot of fun education. So now I'm entering, this will be my 15th year as a wildland firefighter. And um, my, I've moved up through the ranks. I still dig line with a Pulaski or run a chainsaw when I need to but I'm also on a type one incident management team as a fire behavior analyst. And that position um, we are called all over the nation um, as a team. And my job is to predict fire behavior for the next operational period, which may be that evening or it may be the following day so that operations can be set based on expected fire behavior. So that's what I do now. There's a picture of a fire near Red Lodge and one of our um, 
tactical tenders there rolling through the sagebrush preparing to fight fire. This is a, a picture from, we live in Red Lodge uh, right outside of Yellowstone National Park. So um, the Rockies and Yellowstone are obviously a very uh, amazing uh, place to be. And so this particular fire is burning at the Druid Peak, which was um, the namesake later of uh, of wolves that were released from a pen right there in Yellowstone, the, the famous Druid pack. And um, as I watched this fire burn, it was, I also was able to watch um, the Druids, the remnants of the Druid pack running through the Lamar Valley. So it was very powerful to be able to see these two forces of nature operating um, at the same time, wildfire and wolves. This picture kind of shows the, an interesting correlation that, that I saw early on working with um, and when I started with wildfire. And it's, it's a poster, a Forest Service poster from the 50s. And it's showing fire, a wolf made out of flames um, with a burnt landscape behind it. And it says fire, the outlaw, don't turn him loose on the forest. So you know, coming into the 50s, there were the pioneers that were starting to figure out that wolves had a place on the landscape and some pioneers that were starting to figure out that, you know, fire had a place on the landscape, but largely both fire and wolves were not welcome and were, um, were managed uh, excessively to remove them from the landscape. So the, I thought this poster was very interesting because we still hadn't quite figured all of that out. But this picture, this is a picture from Yellowstone of wolves um, working to try to take down uh, a moose and or the moose, moose calf. Um, I put this up because this is a very powerful image. A lot of the images of both wildfire and wolves are powerful, but, and it's used often as a way that I've seen, I've seen it on billboards uh, as an anti-wolf uh, image. But the reality is that wolves are selecting for what they come across most on the landscape. And moose, moose calves make up less than 1% of their diet. So this is not a common scene, but it's a powerful scene. And um, as we know with, um, when you're trying to accomplish something, whether it's politics or whatever, you know, powerful images um, work. This is a, another powerful image. This is an image from uh, the fire of 1910, the Great Fire. And I put this here because this fire was instrumental in changing how we moved forward for the next hundred years in fire management. Um, and it, it was from this fire, which was a lot of destruction and human life, life lost, we started to then suppress fire very aggressively. And later on, there was a rule that, you know, any new fire needed to be extinguished by 10 a.m. the next morning. Without understanding that fire had an ecological role and what was potentially happening by suppressing fire for almost 100 years on the landscape. This image shows, the bottom image shows a, what we call a mosaic or a, uh, it's kind of a mixed severity burn. And I know that um, Lisa Floyd Hanna has talked about fire severity in previous talks. Right, and she's the science director here. At the and she's the, Institute. correct, the science director here. And so what it shows is that um, mosaics like this are fairly, they're, they're a natural thing that happens across the landscape. And you have low severity, high medium severity, and high severity burns. And so, and what that does is it creates diversity across the landscape. And in the absence of these types of mosaics, you have a homogenous forest stand, um, which is not very resilient to either uh, drought or bugs or even fire. So, these types of fire are that have mosaics on the land have a lot of ecological benefit. Um, and then in the top image, you can see some of the uh, regeneration after a fire with lodgepole pine coming back in, which is a fire adapted species. 
Here's a picture of my feet through looking through the canopy of the helicopter there. But even down below on the fire, we were flying over. You could see the mosaics there, right? There was some, some areas that were burned completely, some lightly and some not at all. Here's another image from the helicopter flying over a fire. And um, this is often what I do on a fire as a, as a fire behavior analyst is we fly um, ahead of the fire, trying to figure out what uh, the fire is going to do based on fuels, weather, and topography. Um, this particular fire on Ala in Alaska was burning towards a previous fire scar. Is that the, the light green? Exactly, it's the light green. So um, what that what had happened is the fire, the new fire was budding up into the old fire burn area. And um, because of that, that was a change in fuel type and it was, an, it was an option to help stop the fire in that location. So you can use not only natural features like roads or rivers to stop a fire, but you can use previous fires as well if the conditions are right. This is a nice picture showing a low severity burn. It's burning primarily in the grass fuels and but also taking out some of the trees in the process. So when you think about fire moving through a landscape, it, it varies depending on the season. Mm -hmm. So early on in the season, we may have less uh, severity with fire, but as the summer drags on and we have hot dry days and our live fuel moistures, which would be the green trees and our dead fuel moistures, which would be the dried out grass, all continue to dry it makes fuels more susceptible to fire. And so this particular fire would be fairly easy to control. We could go right in, we could put out this fire, we could stop it in its track tracks. But I think what we need to think about it moving forward is how do we allow fire to burn when we have the opportunity to do that in areas that are not a high risk to the public. That allows for mosaics on the landscape, it allows for forest uh, health and diversity and resilience. Mm -hmm. And this topic obviously is a very wide ranging topic. There's a lot to this topic. And so I'm gonna bump around a little bit. My idea is to ho hopefully to inspire you, your thoughts on this and, um, and your experiences to take it forward. And so uh, that's why it's gonna be a variety here. And so, this is a picture that I took from an airplane um, of uh, wolves moving through the landscape below. In this particular area, they had been in for a long time. I flew this, hmm. this pack of wolves um, you know, week after week and they were in the same area and I, I couldn't really understand, but it was, a, it was a burn area. A fire had burned in there um, earlier that, that same summer. And so after the snows melted, I went back into this area and I was able to hike in. And what I found was the fire that had burned through this area ended up killing a small group of elk, um, mm -hmm. probably through asphyxiation of the smoke. And so they, these elk were in this little drainage and the wolves stayed there and continued to feed on the elk carcasses. Um, so for uh, over a month. Wow. And so that's a way that fire again interacts with, with wolves and, their, and the prey and the landscape. This picture I also took from the airplane. So it's, we would fly in a super cub, which is a small fixed wing aircraft with really big wheels. And you could fly really slow and low. Obviously if I took this from, from the airplane and the wolves don't seem alarmed. Uh, we use a nice telephoto lens and you can zoom in. This, uh, the wolf in the lead is the alpha female of the pack. And the more we've learned about wolves, the more we learn that the alpha females are most often the ones leading the pack. You know, historically, wolf biologists were male and somehow we brought forward our ideas <laughs> that that therefore the males were the leaders. And that's not the case. And it's probably not the case for, um, for <laughs> the human species as well either, right? Um, in a lot of cases. So um, the alpha females often lead the pack activity and they're the leaders of the pack and they're the most adept and often the best hunters of the pack as well. There's another uh, pack moving through the, 
the, the snow there. This was a picture of a fire I was on in, in Yellowstone National Park. And we were ready to jump into action there. But as you may recall, um, in, in the parks, they do still have that policy of trying to let fires burn. Mm -hmm. um, if, if the conditions are right, the fires of 88 really taught us that we, we might need to put some sidebars on how quickly we respond, right? We don't want to wait too long um, because we saw the fires of 88 got too big, too fast, and we're, we, couldn't, we couldn't control them. Mm. That was the largest firefighting effort to date. Everything that was possible that would be thrown at, at suppression of that fire was, was utilized mm. with little uh, success. Um, and so now we monitor very clo closely and the conditions are correct and we can let it burn in some areas and suppress it in other areas and, and constantly reevaluate um, making those decisions. And those decisions are made by the park managers. This is a picture in 95 when the wolves were introduced mm. back into Yellowstone, 1995 and 96. And um, you can see a large, these are elk um, that are right down in the uh, Lamar River. And um, they're, they have no problem just hanging out in the riparian areas and uh, eating until they were, until they were full. Um, and this, this graphic goes along with it. And this is a graphic of the northern elk herd that moves across the northern part of, of Yellowstone. And what you can see is it's gone up and down over the years, started, you know, monitoring it in the 20s at 12,000 and down in the, in the early 70s to about 3,000. And you have the, the black solid line and then you have the gray line in the background. And that, that gray line represents the, the error in the data collection. So anytime you're collecting data, you, there's always a potential for error. error and, um, and that may be because they didn't have as good accounts that season. But what we see in 1995 is that um, they were at record highs, mm -hmm. the Northern Elk herd. Uh, they're uh, at around 20,000 elk in the northern range, and wow. range scientists really estimated that the landscape could, couldn't support much more than 5,000 elk. So what that meant was the elk that were there were uh, malnourished, um, very in poor condition, and um, in this next graphic, well, I'll come to this next graphic, but I'll talk a little bit about the condition of the elk that they were, they were in. This, this shows wolves moving across the landscape and uh, targeting this, this elk here. Um, and I show this picture because wolves have a selective pressure on the landscape. If we look at fire, especially low or moderate intensity fire moving across the landscape, it'll often select for trees that are damaged or drought, drought impacted or um, not maybe as healthy. It, it of course selects trees that are healthy as well. Just like wolves do when they move across the landscape, they are often selecting for um, a sick or injured or, uh, or, or older elk or something that might be mm -hmm. wrong with the elk. But again, that's not always the case either. Um, so you think about the way these selective pressures work on the landscape, and it's interesting how they work Did you take together. that image? I did not take, this one was taken by Dan uh -huh. um, Staler, and he is um, a biologist in Yellowstone. So Dan took this one, good question. And Dan took this one as well, we go back. Um, and so Dan took these photos from the aircraft as well. Um, same aircraft that I would fly in. And, and you can see here, this is a bull elk that was taken down by wolves. And so, uh, you know, the question is, well, why are they killing a bull elk? That seems like it would be very challenging to take down a bull elk, right? And um, so uh, that is true. But the conditions that uh, this, is, this kill was taken um, in a season after the rut, where um, elk, bull elk especially, use all their energy in the rut. And that's the reproductive time for the elk. So they're breeding as much as they can 
and in the process they diminish their their bone marrow and their stores of fat um, and then that can make them more susceptible in in the fall late in the late fall or coming into early winter um, so th that gives you an example of of how it's going to change depending on the the time and the season and what's going on with the herd and what's going on with the wolves this graphic shows that what exactly what I was talking about earlier with the condition of the elk. So if you look at the blue graph, and that is um, high on the left side, the blue bars represent elk, female elk that were killed by hunters. That means humans that we killed. And the majority of those that were killed by humans um, were elk that were around four, five years old. And um, compare that to wolves. This was in the first 20 years after the wolves were introduced into Yellowstone. This is where this data comes from, is Yellowstone and around Yellowstone because that Northern elk herd goes outside of Yellowstone. So of course, there's no hunting in Yellowstone. Make that clear. But, and then you compare that to the age of the elk that wolves were killing Mm. And you'll see that the peak number mm. in the first 20 years was around 16 years old. Wow. Now, now, the little triangles that are going across the top and then dipping down into the shows the, the pregnancy rate of elk. So as they get older, they actually become less, um, they're less reproductive success. So the point mm. of this whole graphic is to say, when we look at how, what is impacting the elk herd, the strongest is, is actually the potential of human. Mm. The humans are killing elk that are in their prime. Reproductive prime. Reproductive prime. And, and wolves are killing elk that are past their reproductive prime, mm. not of the main contributor. Um, and so it's always good to compare that and have that knowledge in your head. And with everything, all types of research, uh, we always have to ask our question, the questions like, how did this, how was this research done? Mm. Where was it done? When was it done? How'd they do it? And was it peer reviewed research? And so I use peer reviewed research because that's not going to be hearsay. That's mm. going to be um, the type of data that we use. We also have to realize it it's, can be just little pieces of data and mm. it may not apply broadly across the landscape. So again, always asking our questions. This was, a, this was research that was done uh, by Ripple and Beshta in, uh, in the park, looking at how when wolves were removed from the landscape, which is where the bar here is on there that runs through both the, the graphs, there's the top graph is aspen regeneration and the bottom is, is riparian cottonwood. Hmm. And what, we've, what the researchers found is that when the wolves were removed from the landscape and the elk numbers were, were, went on the rise, that there was very little regeneration to none in the absence of wolves. And that, if you flash in your brain back to that picture I showed of all those elk in the Lamar River, um, that doesn't allow for any regeneration, new sprouting uh, of, the, of willow or cottonwood or aspen. So, um, so the elk were moving, or the wolves were moving the elk around. Yes, there's, there's a certain amount of that, that elk, um, uh, or I'm sorry, wolves change the behavior of the elk. Mm. And there's a certain numerical response as well, that there was a, a, you know, a high number of elk and then there was less of a uh, number of elk. So you have to think about what are the, all the factors involved. I hear singing <laughs> in the background. Um, so uh, this is a picture that kind of shows that graphic in a visual way. So 1993, this is the same riverbank in Yellowstone. Um, and the arrow points to the same area. And it was heavily browsed in 93 mm. because there were no wolves and there were lots of elk. And then in 2009, after the wolves were uh, introduced in 95 and 96, mm. we can see that regeneration is taking place. That's a human standing there that's circled. And so four to five meters uh, tall. And, and again, we have to ask ourselves, is that just because of wolves? Um, 
Probably not. There's a lot of factors at play. Are wolves a factor? Yes, definitely. This is a picture from the, the Rim Fire in outside of Yosemite. And I throw this in as another example of, as we see climate warming and changing, we see fire intensity growing. And this was another fire that every resource we had, uh, 747s dropping retardant and aircraft dropping water. And it was something that for a period of time was not stoppable. Uh, this is the, this kind of shows the, the growing problem. And that is, uh, a lot of us like to live in the forested areas. Uh, and since uh, 1990, 60% of new homes that are being built have been built in what we call the wild and urban interface. And that's the area where forest fuels and human structures intermix. And we see that happening more and more uh, where this is happening. And so it's putting, it's doing several things. It's putting human homes in heavy fuel areas, it's, but it's also modifying the habitat. It's putting more roadways that, that affects wildlife as well. And so it, it's, it's all interwoven. And so there's at least 46 million homes are now on the wild and urban interface and 120 million people are now living in these areas. Mm. Um, that increases the risk to the public and it increases the risk to the firefighters as well. Uh, this is an aerial image of um, the, of par the town of Paradise. Paradise, um, California. Paradise, California, that was burned in the camp fire. And I wanna show you a before and after photo. There's before and, and here's after. Wow. So and there's quite a few of these that you can see if you search on the, the internet, I'm gonna go back and then through it again. Right so on. you can see the level of destruction. And of course that, that campfire was very destructive. There's 85 people lost their lives and tens, over 10,000 structures destroyed homes. And um, so it is an issue. And part of that is building in the forested areas. And part of it is forest management and our and our the way we approach forest managers both on public land and private land and so how do we solve this problem um, suppression and as i gave several examples of 88 and and the rim of fire suppression doesn't always work we can't always stop mm -hmm. it even with the big aircraft and all the firefighters we have we can't stop it if the conditions are extreme and so is it mitigation and doing work ahead of time? This picture shows an example of a before and after photo. Um, oh, wow. The little yellow arrow points to the same fence post. Now this is an example of a clear cut um, on a line, it's, set, it's, a, it's a spacing of 75 uh, feet. In this particular case, we chose to clear all the vegetation, but you can also do things where you just change the fuel type within a space and reduce the vegetation as well. You can still leave some trees, so you don't have to cut down all the trees around your property, but, um, but in this case, we also have those big piles, which we burn uh, in, the, in the winter when there's snow on the ground, which causes a nutrient release, which allows for nutrient cycling, and especially is powerful in, um, in aspen stands, mm. which really can come back strongly in fires. And this shows an area that the area in green was treated prior to the fire hitting it. Um, and the area in the black had no treatment. And by, by treatment, what, what, what as far mean? as, that's a good question. <laughs> so, uh, as far as reducing the fuel loading and so, um, cutting branches, low branches, limbing up branches, removing dead uh, and down debris uh -huh. that's around the area, and basically kind of creating what it might look like if more fire had been on the landscape, more frequent fire if we had not suppressed fire for the last hundred years. Uh, and so we had gone in there and we re reduced the fuel, and uh, we had when we do that, we, lead, we try to maximize species diversity. We try to maximize age class diversity. Mm. That makes a more diverse landscape and a more realistic landscape. 
And so when the fire did hit this area, it burned, uh, it dropped down to the ground fuels, burned through there, and then continued on. And outside of that area, the trees were all killed. Nearly 100% tree mortality. You can see some trees in the picture of the, but they all ended up dying. And so uh, that's an example. Of course, the tough part is always figuring out where do we do this? Where's the next fire going to be? And just a couple more photos here and we'll wrap it up for questions. I don't know if questions have been coming in there, Bob. But uh, this shows a, a low intensity fire. This is a fire that, uh, that we lit on a fire to kind of burn up a slope and take some fuels out prior to the main fire hitting the, hitting the fire line. So this is an example of that. This was a fire I was on in Oregon and the fire had burned right through the uh, extreme fire danger sign. Uh, so the, si the sign did survive, but a lot of the trees and fuels didn't. This picture, uh, these pictures I'm showing, these are pictures, uh, one is of, of me, um, another is that I took uh, at night. For firefighters, we used to really rely on night to have an opportunity to, to get mm -hmm. a line around the fire or actively engage the fire because Temperatures drop and relative humidities rise and fire behavior settles down. Mm. Um, but what we're seeing with climate change is night conditions are not getting better, which means we have active fire through the night, making it very challenging to, to battle uh, or combat the fire and take advantage of what we used to have. Mm. Um, but we see this more and more where the night conditions have less um, relief from the active fire conditions. Um, this, these graphics are from the Union of Concerned Scientists um, and it shows the effect of wildfire on the, uh, in the West. Um, but of course, climate change is affecting the, the globe. But what you see in this graphic is changing uh, temperatures and it's, it's interesting because it shows us on a macro scale that it's not a uniform change. Because mm. I often run in people who are like, well, it's, it's cold here today. I'm not, what do you, you know, climate change, what's that? <laughs> what's global warming? It's not a thing. And it, and it is, it affects it differently in different pockets. And so we see some areas that are having more uh, drought because of the changing atmospheric conditions. We're having drier fuels. We're having the change in areas that used to have more uh, annual precipitation or not. We see areas that didn't used to have lightning with lots of lightning in the area. And so one of the biggest fires in California, um, the August complex and the LNU complex last year, where we saw um, uh, a, mil uh, you know, a million acres that were burned in California, they had a huge lightning outbreak, a bust of lightning in areas where they don't usually have much mm. lightning. So those sort of things, it's not just warming, it's, it's, it's all sorts of things that are happening on the, on the landscape. And this is another example of this. We had fire, this was at the Point Reyes National Seashore. I was at this fire. Um, I was the fire behavior analyst for this fire. And um, that fire is burning through green ferns. Um, and the fire talking to the fire managers that that live there they 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 had no record mm. of fire ever burning in that area mm. and um and because conditions are changing it doesn't take take much for green ferns to now become burnable so this particular fire we lit to light to meet the main fire front that was coming towards us but it was burning throughout the fire area and green ferns and lush, lush vegetation or what appeared to be lush. Um, and uh, that was a lot of firefighters had to pick their jaws up because it just didn't make sense that fire was burning mm -hmm. in these areas. So we see with, with climate change, we see the increasing wildfire season. Um, it was in the 70s, the fire season, we'd say it was five months, and now it's seven plus months. In some areas, they say it's year round. We just have fire season nonstop. And the number of large fires is growing. 
this was a picture from a fire in California near Yukaipa where my sister lives. And so I put that picture, this is put this picture for her. Um, but it's, uh, it's, as you can see, there's not a lot you can do with, with aircraft when it's fires are that big. So we're seeing uh, the forests are drier. Um, they're, con they're primed for fire. The temperatures are rising and the snow melts happening up to four weeks earlier, which are making, uh, you don't have the longevity of the moisture that sits on the surfaces because of climate change. Uh, this is a picture of the Paradise Fire, which I showed you um, that graphic earlier. So this is a satellite image from NASA. I didn't take this one. This is a NASA, NASA image, but, um, but it's very interesting to see the effect and the amount of smoke that's being put up in the landscape or into the atmosphere because of wildfires. And as we see this graphic here, we're seeing it's, it's spiraling. We have worse, worsening conditions and snow is melting sooner. Temperatures are rising and fires are burning into the, into, the, into the tundra in Alaska in areas that we've never really had much of an issue. But when that happens, there's a lot of carbon deposits that are in that tundra. And so when that tundra burns, it's releasing significant amounts mm. of carbon into the atmosphere which now wildfire is a significant contributor to uh, climate change gases. Mm -hmm. So in the past, wow. it, it didn't see, it wasn't much of an impact, but as we worsen it, it is. Mm. That's disturbing. It's disturbing, mm -hmm. yes. So we have, so fire managers in Alaska are starting to take a new approach. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good point is like, we have to adapt our strategies. And so in areas where they used to let it, burn and remote areas of Alaska, they're now starting to consider maybe we should suppress mm -hmm. this fire to prevent large amounts of carbon to be in, released into the atmosphere. So five of the largest fires in California history happened last year. <laughs> in mm -hmm. all of the history. Mm -hmm. um, so the largest one is that August complex burned over a million acres. And the other one I mentioned is that LNU complex um, and I was on, on the fire near that one uh, as a fire manager, uh, a fire behavior analyst. Mm. I put this in here because we are in Prescott and um, I grew up in Prescott, graduated from Prescott High School. And, and so in, in June of 2013, the Granite Mountain hotshots were, were um, caught uh, not far from here near Yarnell. Um, and they were caught in a, um, a fire and they attempted to deploy their fire shelters, but did, did not have enough of an area to do that. And 19 of the Granite Mountain hotshots were killed. So that hit home to me mm -hmm. as a fire manager. And uh, it feels personal when firefighters die doing this work because we try very hard not to. Um, you know, we try to take care of each other. So every year when I, since this, when I start my fire season, I start thinking about, uh, these guys and, and all the firefighters that have lost their lives, um, as conditions worsen, we have to be more vigilant as firefighters and also as, as homeowners and landowners mm -hmm. to try to take responsibility for our own land to minimize loss. <clears throat> and I'll wrap up with this slide. So um, these are two photos that, that I took. Um, we, we have wolves on the landscape and we have, we have fire on the landscape as well. And we've had to learn to manage and live with both. And we're continuing to learn how to do that. And we uh, are successful in some ways and some ways are harder. You know, living with wolves is not easy for those ranchers that live in the area that have to deal with wolves coming in and killing their livestock or even killing their, their family dog. Mm. It's not uh, easy, but there's, there's measures you can take to minimize that likelihood as ranchers. Um, and it's the same for wildfire. Um, you, the homeowners and landowners need to take responsibility understanding that fire, it's not when, or it's not uh, if, <laughs> It's when mm -hmm. wildfire is coming to your door. And so taking responsibility and even I, it, this, uh, even the, those of you that are in the, in the East Coast, um, it's, 
with climate change, areas that didn't used to burn and wildfire is starting to pick up. I was on fires out there in South Carolina um, and of course, Florida and, mm -hmm. and, and Georgia. So there's the fires are picking up and they're seeing more and more fires um, north in the east where, compared to where they used to. So we have to adapt and learn to live and take responsibility where we can and, uh, and mm -hmm. um, take each other, take care of each other moving forward. That's all I have in the presentation portion of okay, it. Okay, well, great. We, we have had a few questions come in. And then, of course, I have a few questions for you. Okay. And I'm going to ask the first question, and it comes from Tom Cahill. And uh, he's curious about the state of the wolf reintroduction program in the in, um, eastern, the, the Mexican gray wolf reintroduction program. So okay. can you give us an update on the status there? The status. Okay. So, you know, that that is an interesting uh, program because both the Mexican gray wolves and the Yellowstone wolves were introduced, right? Um, but there, it's a very a widely different uh, conditions. Mm. And so um, the Yellowstone wolves were introduced in 95 and 96, and they were intended to be also released in 97, but they were doing so well, they stopped. Yeah. The Mexican gray wolf program started in 98 with reintroductions and have been has done many introductions year after year trying to help that population establish and so um, it's the numbers have slowly come up for the Mexican gray wolf and there are somewhere around 200 of them oh. in the wild now in with the majority of them being in New Mexico hmm. um, and that's good because two-thirds of the original recovery area was in New Mexico um, but when we look at that the Mexican gray wolf was was extirpated from the wild. They were extinct in the wild. There were no Mexican wolves running around uh, for a long time. They were trapped out. They were trapped out and killed and removed from the landscape, which like a lot of the, uh, the gray wolves up in Yellowstone and the rest mm. of the U.S. were as well. So they found seven individuals that were Mexican gray that had gen distinct genetics of the Mexican gray wolves. And they started a breeding program and they started releasing those wolves back into the wild. And, uh, but in some cases, those wolves had been in captivity for seven generations. So think about that. He, they, these wolves had been in zoos, they had been in cages, wow. they had been around people and, and those were released back into the wild. And we compare that to the Yellowstone story where wolves were uh, captured in the wild in Canada and dropped into Yellowstone where there was 20,000 elk <laughs> that were not in the greatest of condition. So there was a, it was definitely, a, and there was a lot more protected land around Yellowstone as well. So if you look at um, Yellowstone's area and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, you have 2.3 million acres of land. So it was El Cabin. Um, it was El Cabin and, and it was protected and uh, it was a little bit different conditions. But um, so they are, you know, the Mexican gray wolf have always struggled. It's been more of a challenge because mm -hmm. of they came from captivity for so long, but they are out there on the landscape and they're, they're making their way. All right. Let's see. Um, well, Tom has Tom Cahill has a, another question uh, to follow up on that, and he's he's wondering about the the wolf coyote interbreeding in the Western United States. What's what's the status there? What do you know about that? Uh, so that that happens rarely, um, and I think it does tend to happen more in exploited populations. What does that mean? So. Um, if, if you have a, an ecosystem that's, in, that's intact and it doesn't have a lot of human mm. interventions and, and, and conflict with humans, um, it happens less. Wolves definitely select for wolves when it comes to breeding time. They don't select for coyotes, um, but it has happened on a, occasion. And so if you look to the East where they have the red red wolf, mm. you know, and the, what was called the Eastern timber wolf. Um, they at one point thought that those wolves were totally different species. Um, the red wolf is Canis rufus mm. and the Eastern timber wolf is Canis lupus lycaon. And so, um, but genetic studies showed that they were a lot closer related than once was thought. 
oh. even though their physical attributes were so different. Mm -hmm. So, um, but they on that red wolf program, they do have a lot of problem with coyote interbreeding with what the red wolves there. So it can happen. It's not common, um, especially if you have a normally functioning wolf pack because they tend to not get along with coyotes. All right, great. Let's see. Um, here's a question from William Werner. He wants to know, could some level of insurance reform help with fire in the Western United States? I think that is a, that's an excellent question. Uh, and as I had mentioned, you know, wildfire had not been a significant part of climate change. It also had not been a significant part of insurance claims. <laughs> and so for many, many years, oh. you know, it was flood. That was the big thing. And so insurance companies really focused heavily on, you know, what was going on in typhoon season <laughs> and, uh, and very little on wildfires. But what we've seen in the last 10 years, especially is hundreds of millions of dollars of homes destroyed, mm -hmm. um, uh, probably into the billion range. And so so insurance companies are definitely taking more of an awareness to uh, wildfires. And many insurance companies are starting to drop coverage for, for homes in the wild and urban interface where they are, where the homes have not mitigated for mm. wildfire hazard. And so uh, definitely the insurance companies have taken notice. That makes sense. And some of them have even told and have removed coverage and told the homeowners to go somewhere else until they can figure out how to reduce risk. All right, I'm looking at our questions and uh, another wolf question. This comes from Andrew Luck and he wants to know, can wolf opponents legitimately make the argument that wolves decrease herbivore grazing and thus increase the fuel load? Hmm, that's an interesting question. <laughs> it is. Well, you know, it is all, it's all tied together. Now, whether that argument can be made is really going to be site specific mm. and vegetation specific. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things that we can't extrapolate broadly and would require some research to get a better answer. But I think that's a good you know, that sounds like a good graduate project to, yeah. to look at that um, because it, you know, lots of ungulates on the landscape or hooved mammals do change the, the vegetation composition, which changes the fuel load. Um, and so, but again, is the, is, is the fire primarily carried by mm. forest fuels or is it carried by ground fuels like grasses and herbaceous? So, and that changes based on the landscape as well. And it changes based on the time of the season because mm -hmm. an early season fire will only stay on the ground fuels. And a late season fire may transition to the can canopy of the trees. Mm -hmm. So it's a complex, good question, complex answer. All right, I'm gonna pull one more from, from the viewers. And then I have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask. <clears throat> How much of the forest land, this comes from so Sally Stockwell. How much of the forest land do you expect to permanently change to grasslands, shrublands after experiencing more frequent and hotter fires? So that is a good question. And there's, there's been a lot of speculation on that. And so as we have climate warming, some species of, of trees are we're already maybe on the threshold, on the upper threshold of them being able to survive in that, that landscape in certain areas. So when you have a high intensity fire come through, a stand replacing fire combined with an increase of climate change in that area that mm. has changed the threshold of that species, then you have a potential that it will transition to a different forest type or grassland type. Um, we have seen though cases that have been shocking. There, there was an, a case in Yellowstone of a fire that had burned through a, a lodgepole pine stand and it was a stand replacing fire. Now lodgepole is, is regenerated through fire. 
primarily, serotonous cones that, op that open when temperatures reach around 113 degrees. And if you ever wanna try it, you can put some around your campfire, <laughs> but they'll open up in the fire. Um, and so that, that's what happened. The fire went through, it was a stand replacing fire. The cones opened up and wind dispersed and regenerated. And, and for you know five, six, seven years later, there was a, a whole new mat of lodgepole pine in there. So it looked like it was gonna regenerate in what it once was. And then there was a very hot, dry summer again, a high intensity fire came through again, but this time it came through before these lodgepole had a chance to even develop wow. cones. So they didn't even have cones on it and it burned through that area again. So the scientists were convinced and the, bio, uh, the botanist biologists, they were all, they said, well, this won't be a lodgepole stand anymore. But over time, far away, huh. you know, seeds dispersed from miles away and slowly took uh, root. And now this stand in Yellowstone is the, the thickest lodge poles that you've ever seen there with great spacing around them. So sometimes we don't know, it takes time. We tend to think of things in our human time scale and it's more of an ecological time scale, both with wolves and wildfire. Great, thanks. Well, I have a human question. A human question, right? Yeah. So clearly you've worked with people who have held an oppositional worldview to the work you do, wolves and fire. I mean, just think about wolf reintroduction in Wyoming or mandatory fire reduction on the grounds of multi-million dollar properties. So how do you do this? I mean, how do you interact with folks with such an oppositional worldview and have the success that you've had. Yeah. Give us some secrets here. I think the secret is, is baby steps. What um, do you mean? When you're, when you're talking with someone, you know, humans tend to come with a very set preconceived notion um, to interactions on the landscape, especially. Now, those that are part of, you know, webcasts like this and seminars tend to come with a little bit more open mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, not always. I've definitely had my share of folks that have come with a very set mindset. Uh, but I think um, when you're interacting with people on the landscape, they don't have much reason to listen to you or mm -hmm. believe you or trust you. Mm -hmm. So for to, to really share that message, you have to build trust. That's kind of a step, but that does, doesn't happen in a, in a one conversation. So I think the idea is like as much as a lot of people are like, oh, I really I want to change people's minds about wolves, the pro people, pro wolf people say, I want to I want to change the anti wolf people's mindset. And um, I, I say, well, it's going to take a relationship. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to just mm -hmm. go in there and change their mind like that with a snap of a finger. It takes time. So it sometimes what I found with wolves, it, it took sitting down at the rancher's table um, time and time again and having a cup of coffee and not trying to change his or just, her mind at just all. Just listening. Just sit, just listening and talking. And every once in a while, they would say something that was so wrong that I could, <laughs> could no longer sit on my hands or cover it. So I'd have to say, well... That's not correct, right? <laughs> but they would say a handful of things that were wrong and I, you, know, you just can't correct people all constantly on everything. So I think you have to choose your battles. You have to be patient, take some baby steps and recognize that there's a lot of misinformation out there mm -hmm. in the world. And a lot of these people, that's where they get their, you know, we, we, <laughs> we saw that during the, the last, the presidential, right? Okay, so there was a lot of misinformation out there, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so, and it's a lot of bits and pieces of information. So the best thing that we can do is approach someone saying, hey, we are open-minded about this. This is where we get our information from. This is why we question that information. This is why we believe that information and take it or leave it and be patient. Mm. Sort of meet people where they are. You have to meet where people where they are and you have to really be gentle and moving forward from that location. <laughs> So figuring it out and a little bit at a time and, and over, over time, if you have the patience mm. and if they have the patience, then maybe you can change people's mindset slowly. 
All right. As a firefighter, though, I found it comes with an immediate level of trust, mm. which was different from the wolf side. You know, when I'd show up at a uh, ranch in my wolf truck, I was immediately met with like stink eye, right? <laughs> Not always. And that's the thing. It's like, we can't stereotype any group. There were great ranchers that I worked with. So, but often I got the like, oh, who's this guy? Mm -hmm. You show up in a fire engine and <laughs> often they're like, hey, thank you for getting here and helping mm -hmm. us, right? But there's definitely people that don't trust government fire engines versus local fire engines. And so there's a, yeah. it's a diverse landscape. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you a hard question here. Okay. The reality of a hotter and drier climate in the Western U.S. is daunting, both from a wildlife perspective and kind of that urban wildfire interface. Where, where are the bright spots of promise? Are, are there particular projects that you think deserve our support? Yeah, I think, well... <laughs> As we've uh, said for a long time, the bright spots are our youth, right? Hopefully they're gonna mm -hmm. move forward um, and bring good messages forward. And so we have to do our best to help, help those youth with have good information and good heads on their shoulders. Um, for me with, you know, on the wolf side of things, I think we've come across a lot of ways to live with wolves on the landscape. Uh, programs like uh, range rider programs or that allow um, people on horseback or ATVs to, to work on the ranches, to support the rancher, to haze and chase wolves away from livestock. Those programs have worked well, but they take mm. people, take a lot of energy. But there's a lot of people out there that want to help. But that involves working on a ranch and, and all that goes with that as well as approaching that. From the wildfire side, I'm really thinking that, you know, first of all, homeowners need to take responsibility and reach out to their local fire departments and, you know, and ask for help. Now, a majority of firefighters in the US are volunteers. Um, and so most of the firefighters that initially respond are volunteers. And they're the ones that are out there and working in, in your communities and they're your neighbors as well. Mm. And so I, I think it's important. I come from a department that's a combination department, primarily um, staffed with volunteer firefighters, volunteer EMTs, volunteer search and rescue. And, um, and so I, I, I digress a little bit, but I wanted to say that those, those organizations like that, like Red Lodge Fire Rescue are, are um, as a breed apart. And we need more of those organizations that are actively involved. We need more volunteers nationwide um, in the fire service and the medical service where we have a shortage mm. of volunteers. So, but back to the fire thing, in addition to taking responsibility and reaching out to your local fire department, either for help or to volunteer, <laughs> but uh, I'm a strong advocate of bringing fire back to the landscape in the form of prescribed burning. Mm. And we, the federal fire managers have been doing a good job of that on forest service lands and BLM lands. And the idea is if we can bring fire onto the landscape under that low intensity or moderate intensity mm. conditions, we can get some cleansing or, or burning of forest fuels uh, and, and, the, and the forest surface to kind of remove the, the decadent fuel buildup that's under our, under our conditions. Mm -hmm. That's our responsibility. Yeah, it's our responsibility that we'll have the resources there to deal with it. So if we're gonna do a prescribed burn, we have lots of firefighters and lots of fire equipment and we have the conditions and we're ready. And so we have an opportunity to burn a landscape, which it needs, um, instead of waiting until August when a fire comes and it's unstoppable because it's burning and it's a stand replacing fire. And so we need to find ways to bring fire back on private land as well. And I know it's scary, mm. but we have to look for those opportunities, embrace it, reach out to our, all our fire partners mm. and figure out how we can do it so that we can, it will then 
be a change in forest and fuel structure, hmm. like we saw in that picture from Alaska, where we'll see more. So when the fire does come, it'll be less likely to be a stand replacing high intensity fire because we will have removed some of the fuels in there. So that's my big things. I'm pushing for prescribed, prescribed fire. I know they've been doing it a lot in the East and we need to start doing it more in the West. Hmm. So have you had um, some examples of engaging with large private landowners and sort of uh, encouraging them to, to move towards prescribed burns? Yes, and uh, it's, that's baby steps as well. Yeah, I was wondering and, about that. Yeah, and figuring that out. And, you know, everyone's worried about liability. Uh, no one wants a fire that starts that burns down other people's homes like the, you know, in the Los, yeah. Los Alamos. And, and so everyone's aware of that. But we have to, the risk on the other side of not doing prescribed fire is much greater. And so we, it's better for us to, to start that dialogue and, and explain the process and help educate everyone mm -hmm. and how we can manage low into, as a, and as a fire behavior analyst, I'm able to bring that knowledge and expertise to, to homeowners and explain the process or landowners more specifically when big parcels of land. So there are some near in Montana that we've started work on. And so, and they have all across the, all across the West, I think it's starting to, to take hold, um, but we definitely need to all work together in that process, understanding, because it also puts smoke in the air. Which well, there was one question about about smoke in the air mm -hmm. um, on, from from the audience. That, you know, and uh, what that, are your thoughts there? This, this seems like a big challenge. That is a big challenge, putting smoke in the air. And so, what well, we do look at the conditions um, that um, when we light the fire. Sometimes you have lifting, and sometimes you don't. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, when a wildfire is burning we often will have inversions that set in for periods maybe early in the morning that, that smoke everyone out. And so if you're near a forest fire or not even near, you can be a long ways away and the, your area will get smoked mm -hmm. out from air smoke moving through the atmosphere. Um, but when we do prescribed fire, we try to do it in a conditions that have good lifting. And so the smoke will go up and out, uh, out of the atmosphere. And then it's a small fire, so it's extinguished within a, a, a day, an operational period. I also wanna point out that when we do those prescribed fires, we are burning um, primarily forest fuel, which is trees. Wildfires are now burning mm -hmm. more and more things that are not just forest fuel, right? They're burning homes, right. structures. And when structures are burning, they put all sorts of toxic, nasty yeah. uh, smoke into the air that firefighters breathe, that we all breathe. And so it is a concern. We have to figure out the conditions. If we can get the conditions right, we can do prescribed burning in small uh, patches that have very little impact to local, wow. local communities. Well, great. Well, John, I think we've come to the end of our questions and the end of our time together. And I just want to really express my appreciation for you taking the time to, to engage with us. And uh, what if somebody in the audience has a, a question for you? Um, how can they contact you? Uh, that's a good question. They, you could always send uh, an, an email to me um, at john, J-O-N, at redlodgefire.com. And um, so feel free to email that. I can answer any follow-up follow questions you have about that. All right, great. Well, good luck and thank you for all your hard work. And thank you all for being with us tonight and uh, look forward to seeing you again. So good night.